Let's get started. Okay, so what's the nature of light? Okay, at this point we know the answer, right? So what's the nature of light? Feel free to jump in. Large yeah. magnetic wave. Uh, as far as we know, light is a wave, right? Uh, we discussed that number of times. Off the of that, light is a wave. Discovery Channel. But how do we know that light is a wave? And ABC News, Discovery News Break. Good evening, everyone. Astronomers announced today they have found six new planets orbiting nearby stars. This brings the total number of planets discovered beyond our solar system to 28. Astronomers find planets by looking for stars that wobble. That unsteadiness is caused by the faint gravity of an orbiting planet pulling on the star. That's Discovery News Break. Okay, so I kind of recorded this roughly about 15 to 20 years ago. Boy, the technology advanced. All right, so at the time, they discovered about 30 planets. Today, we got like thousands upon thousands of planets, and, and some of these planets are Earth-like planets. Okay, so I got three questions. So question number one, we know that the planets reflect light. So how is it possible to detect these planets, given the fact that they belong to these stars and the stars are usually glare, so you cannot see these planets directly? So how do we get to detect these planets without being able to see them? Any ideas, any suggestions? All right, so that's question number one. Mm -hmm. Question number two, is it possible to actually make these planets vanish? Angel's novel two-eyed telescope may be the first to analyze directly the faint light. So you can, you can make this star vanish so that you can actually see the planets directly. Would that be a possible thing? An alien planet. The two mirrors will be yoked together to create history's biggest pair of binoculars. Each mirror will have a slightly different view of the star. The light waves from these two vantage points will be combined to reveal a distant planet's light. Well, the difficulty with trying to see planets around stars is that they can be a million or even a billion times fainter than a star. So any kind of glare from the star spoils your view of the planet. So if that's the case, how do we get to see these planets if they are about a million to a billion times? There's a trick to get rid of the star. Dimmer than the stars are. So how do we get rid of the star? Light and leave the planet light there. And what you can do is combine. Any ideas or suggestions? Take a look at this soap bubble. This is beautiful. Look at the colors. The iridescent colors that you're looking at. So what causes these colors to form? Where do we get the colors from? Refraction. All right, so uh, refraction is, uh, do you know how to explain that? Because different wavelengths of light refract at different angles, so we see them separated. All right, and I'm gonna give you five points. Refraction has something to do with it, absolutely. But aside from that, what else factors into this one? Mm -hmm. All right, I'm not sure if this is gonna work. All right, I don't have the video for that one, but we'll get back to it. All right, speaking of, oh, it's working fine. <laughs> speaking of finding planets, then obviously if we keep growing at the rate that we are, is it, uh, human species, eventually, sooner or later, within the next few hundred years to a thousand years or so, we will run out of resources. So we have to start thinking about colonizing the universe. We've discussed that before. So if we're looking for Earth-like planets, speaking of Earth-like planets, it's also the possibility that there may be life elsewhere in the universe, intelligent life like us. So is it possible that you're being visited by something like that? All right, let's check to see why this thing is not. Let's get it to move. The very idea of alien life on alien worlds was once incendiary. In the year 1600, at the Field of Flowers in Rome, a pyre was prepared for a heretic. His name was Giordano Bruno, a philosopher and former monk. Bruno lived only a few years before telescopes were invented. Yet Bruno was convinced that every star had planets, and every planet teemed with life. Didier Coulot was risking his career if he had been incorrect, but Bruno, whether right or wrong, had risked his very life. Imprisoned for eight years by the Inquisition, he had been begged to recant. On this day, there would be no such offer. Other worlds, a disturbing idea, an idea that must be suppressed. Wasn't Earth a unique creation? Would each of Bruno's worlds have its own Jesus? Pull on one thread of Bruno's thinking, and all of Catholicism seemed to unravel. His writings were declared erroneous. His volume ordered, burned, and placed on the index of forbidden books. But Bruno remained defiant. Most criminals were strangled first and later burned in effigy. But Bruno's heresy was so corrosive that he was sentenced to die by flame. The man who dared to say that Earth was not the only world God created now paid the terrible price of his convictions.
right, so is there any evidence of being visited by creatures from space who may be just as intelligent, if not more intelligent than we are? How do we justify that using physics? Can we? Tests over the next few weeks revealed an even more puzzling problem. Data from the 94-inch mirror simply didn't make sense. It seemed to indicate that the mirror could not focus. As the evidence mounted, no one was eager to confront the possibility of a major malfunction. The primary contractor who had built the mirror and the telescope, and who was nominally in charge of helping to set up and align the optics, was saying in this period that there wasn't a problem. So I was on the one hand saying there was a problem. The official contractor on the other hand was saying there wasn't a problem. And then all at once, the problem was too obvious to deny. A mistake in the primary mirror, an optical error one fortieth of the thickness of a human hair, had left Hubble seriously flawed. The astronomical community was devastated. It was finally in late June that the final data came in, and we couldn't deny it. And it was just a crushing blow. I mean, I remember getting a call on a Sunday afternoon, and I was crushed. The mirror disaster was immediately followed by a public relations fiasco. The press and public savaged NASA for its apparent hubris and incompetence. Okay, so how do, you, how do we really determine the perfect shape of a spherical lens or, or a mirror? How does that happen? Why did NASA think that they actually had the perfect shape for their mirror? All right, so that's your question number six. How do they determine the perfect shape of a spherical lens or a mirror? I think today it's a piece of cake, but back then when they were working on it, that wasn't. So how did they figure it out back then? Did they measure all the light coming in and see if it hits the focus? I mean, I guess if it's... Okay, I'm Matthew, I'm gonna give you five points for that one. How do you, did you say they measure it? Or is it something you could see? Uh, I think you'd have to measure it because you would you'd basically take the light in and the light out and see that they're the same. And then if they all hit the same point, then you could tell that it's a perfect mirror. I'll give you five points for that one. <clears throat> all right, so next question. Creating an aircraft able to cruise at Mach 3 was difficult enough, but the Stunkworks also had to face the challenge of combining this level of performance with a new science of stealth. To avoid features that would create strong radar reflections, the plane had taken on a revolutionary shape. The wings were blended into the body, and the long surfaces on the forward fuselage were designed to deflect incoming radar waves. So were the inward angled twin fins, the pointed engine cones, and the nearly flat lower fuselage. Also, they developed a special radar absorbent plastic or composite that was incorporated into all the leading edges. You're muted. You're muted. Okay, so <laughs> what, what, what does it mean to absorb radar? How does that work? To not let it go back to the, the dish and all go to the focus point. So it would have to diffuse it to different locations. Okay, so that's more like reflection, right? Yeah. Okay, so I'll give you five points on that one. But when we say absorption, which means that it literally gets absorbed into the material, right? So how does that happen? Probably turns into heat. Okay, that's not bad. So I'm gonna give you five points on that one. So how do they make that happen? They, they use these special polymers, but how do they, yeah. how, how does that work? When you look at an SR-71, 20% of what you see is composite. You know, it's just unbelievable at that time. And it was developed in our shops. An SR-71 was 100 times smaller radar return than an F-14, which is only half as big and was developed 10 years later. So All right, so just for the hell of it. Um, it's not entirely related to the discussion, but it's somewhat related to it. These stealth aircraft, military air aircraft, how fast do you think they move? 3,000 miles per hour. Okay, Matthew, why did you say that? Because uh, I was looking at the SR-71 like six months ago or something. I think they, they, they go that fast? I think, I think so. Okay, um, can you check that and verify online? Yeah, if you, if you feel <laughs> I like you're going, wrong, but... Uh, the, the reason why I'm saying that, because if you're going fast in the sound, what happens? There's going to be a sonic boom, right? So it's going to, they're going to be able to detect you fairly fast. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> especially if the whole idea is it's still... 2,200, 2,200. again? 2,200 miles per hour. 2,200 miles per hour. That's, damn, that's really, really fast once again. And they still have some kind of a radar cross-section, so the stuff doesn't, they're not going to look like birds on radar because you're still going to get a little bit of a radar profile, so that's weird. All right, give yourself a That was the really, truly first airplane specifically designed with stealth in mind. On December 22nd, 1964, the SR-71 was rolled out onto the flight line at Lockheed's Burbank plant, the Blackbird. 
painted in black radar absorbent ferrite paint. The Blackbird was an extraordinarily future. So black paint. Touristic. Okay, guys, in terms of radar absorption, the thickness of the paint is going to matter. Machine. Uh, so how do they figure out how thick the paint is supposed to be? Uh, so that's the thing we look into. All right, part of this is a review. So we will once again overlay the mathematics on top of it. Nature of light, composed of waves of particles. They say an apple inspired Newton's law of gravity, but it was actually a comet. From the History Channel, the official network of every millennium, this is Time Lab 2000. By 1680, Isaac Newton is already renowned for his brilliance. But for the last 10 years, he has retreated into seclusion. He dabbles in alchemy. His work goes unpublished. Then, a spectacular comet appears in the night sky. His genius is reawakened. He emerges from isolation, builds a telescope to study the heavens, and decides to make his ideas public. The result? One of the most brilliant books in the history of science, the Principia. It lays out his revolutionary theory of gravity and the laws of motion. In the words of Alexander Pope, nature's laws lay hidden night. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. For the History Channel, I'm Sam Larson. 30 years ago, space was considered All right, so Newton stops the vacuum. And then we will have a discussion, because at this point, you guys know quite a bit of physics. Except for a curious clue. All right, so as far as Newton is concerned, the tail of a what's pushing the tail of a comet? Comet. Away from the sun is the particles of light. His argument is the light is composed of particles, because the particles colliding with particles can transfer momentum, which means that they're going to be able to transfer motion. Tail of a comet is composed of particles of dust and ice, and the particles colliding with particles will get pushed away from the sun. Obviously, the sun is generating tremendous amount of gravity, so gravity is pulling everything towards the sun. And the tail is getting pushed away from the sun because light is composed of particles. That was the argument that Newton had. All right, so against Newton's argument, as Newton is 1680, Newton's argument is actually a reaction to Christian Huygens' argument. Huygens thought that the light was composed of waves. So what do we know about waves? We know that the waves interfere constructively. Notice that the amplitude gets larger or destructively where the amplitude vanishes or it cancels out completely. Hey, Isaac Newton, who investigated both refraction and dispersion. According to Newton, light was made up of particles that obeying the law of inertia, traveled through empty space in straight lines. For Newton, refraction, or the bending of light by matter, could be explained by the gravitational attraction between light and matter. However, at about the same time and on the same subject, an opposing viewpoint arose in Holland. Christian Huygens, a Dutch physicist and astronomer, theorized that rather than being composed of particles, or corpuscles as Newton called them, light was made up of waves. And in the long run, his idea would be seen as the correct one. The problem with Huygens' theory, which is 10 years earlier than Newton's was, waves cannot transfer momentum that was the that was the uh, underlying idea as far as newton was concerned waves cannot transfer momentum if light is a transverse wave the particles instead of getting pushed they would just wave up and down up and down perpendicular to the motion of the wave that's the way newton was thinking all right guys just let's get back to the electromagnetic wave theory is it possible for waves to transfer momentum yes or no yeah okay the answer to that question is yeah so now that you say yeah explain why uh, because they it, carry a charge? Yeah. <laughs> they don't carry a charge. No, guys, the waves, the electromagnetic waves, can they transfer momentum? Absolutely they can, right? This is That's called radiation pressure, all right? Because they can transfer momentum, which means that they generate radiation pressure. 